Hey, my name is Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Restore. And at our church, we talk a lot about wanting to be a part of restoring faith in Jesus and the church. So we want you to know, wherever you find yourself on your spiritual journey, whether you're deconstructing or reconstructing, whether you're disentangling, doubting, rebuilding, no matter where you are, we want you to know that you are not alone. And we want to be a support for you as you journey down this road of faith. So if you have questions or you need support, we would love to chat with you. You can reach out to us through our website at restoreaustin.org. And we hope you enjoy this week's message. I am so delighted to be with you all this morning. It is such a treat. I've never been to Austin. Um, so I landed yesterday and an hour later, I was in line at La Barbecue. Y'all. That was like soul nurturing. Oh my goodness. Um, I don't know what to do with the humidity. That's like a real weird thing to me. Like it's just so wet, but that's okay. That's okay. I also don't know how Starbucks stays in business. I was like looking up for coffee and I was like, oh my gosh, it's just, it's so many good things. It's so many good things. So um, I just can't believe we get to talk about something that is so, so important because whether you're parenting or not, how we treat young people is vital for who we are as followers of Jesus together. But here's this thing I've noticed, especially if you're parenting, you love God. You may have more questions than tidy answers. You may have belief and also unbelief, but you love God. You love your kids. Again, you may have more questions than tidy answers, but you know, although there are mysteries in the universe, like how do I get them to go to bed or Um, How many more Pokemon facts am I going to have to learn? Nevertheless, I love my kids. You love your kids. I think, if I'm not mistaken, yep, those are my kids and my husband, Curtis. Uh, That's our little Christmas trip. We have family in Central California, so that's the Central Coast behind us um, in Pismo Beach. And, um, you know, they are just delightful. And then these are my boys, specifically, Riley and Peyton. Riley's nine, Peyton's seven. Um, And that picture is incredibly sweet, but what they're actually doing is playing a game called blowing each other's faces as hard as you can. (laughs) So you know what happened 10 seconds after I took the picture, right? You know, you know. He spat in my eye! The game was blowing their face as hard as you can. It's like the worst COVID game ever. (laughs) What are we doing? But as much as I want to know why, and there are no tidy answers, there's deep love. So if you love God and you love your kids, so why does it sometimes feel so hard to introduce your kids to God? Why is that so sticky? You know, maybe it's because the faith you grew up with is not quite the faith you want to pass along. Maybe it's because you are newer to faith and you've got enough stuff you don't know yet and you're worried you're supposed to be an answer giver for them. Maybe you are just in a place where you have so many questions of your own, worthy questions with no tidy answers, and that means you don't know how to answer theirs. Maybe you just feel afraid of giving them bad religion. And it doesn't help that there is this slew of voices telling you that your job as a Christian parent is to raise obedient disciples who follow a formula of dinnertime devotions and perfect Sunday school attendance. And you just know in your gut, like that's not really for you. I saw how much coffee some of you downed before you got here. You like barely squeaked in today. So this perfect attendance idea, unless you're like this unicorn church where you're all here every week, Zach? Is that, oh, yeah. Okay. I didn't think so. But what a kid really needs is not a family that follows a formula. They need a family that follows Jesus in everyday ways. They don't need a family that's striving to fit a mold. They need a family that's been captivated by the dream. So I wanna talk about the dream today. We're gonna be in Genesis 1, uh, starting in verse 26, if you're a read-along kind of person, but it'll be on the screen as well. So God said, let us make human beings in our image, 
to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth, and the small animals that scurry on the ground. So God created human beings in God's own image. In the image of God, God created them. Male and female, God created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God looked over all God had made and saw it was very good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God finished their work of creation. So God rested from all their work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when God rested from all God's work of creation. Now, a few notes on the creation poem for us today. The story is structured where everything builds to the most important part. And so all of the details about creation, this vision of order and filling, it culminates with humanity. It is most important to get to this charge God has to fill the earth and reign over it, to care for it and steward it well. Humanity then become image bearers and power sharers, ambassadors of their creator God. It's all been building to them. And that the humans get to fill it up clues us into something else really important. This world, contrary to what you may have heard, it wasn't perfect. It was very good. It wasn't perfect because it wasn't done. Finishing the work got to be humanity's job because our power-sharing, image-putting-within-us kind of God said, you will get to fill this earth and reign over it and steward it well in my name. That is the dream, that each human would be able to be part of filling it up and make their mark and have their stamp on this all as they bear God's own image. On the seventh day, God was done with their part, but it wasn't done yet. God rested and creation is primed so that humanity would get to work on it in a way that matches who God is, meaning joyful and abundant, just, creative, ordered. This world in harmony with and reflective of God's own character. And all of that would happen because image-bearing ambassador representatives, each and every one of us, would do our thing, okay? You have to understand how much creative liberty we have in this, right? This is like how you get to take the goodness that is an avocado, and make guacamole, and it is very good. We were meant to do our thing in this world as representatives of God, to be in harmony with God's own character. God's dream is that all of creation would be in harmony with and reflective of God's own character. All of creation. And harmony is most familiar to us probably from music. If you're a musician type, you know harmony. Harmony is not unison. It's not singular. Harmony is the differentiated notes on a chord that make it better. Hi, I didn't ask you this beforehand. Would you mind going back to the piano for a sec? Thanks. <laughs> Could you play us one note, please? Thank you. Could you add some harmony? And some more, and another. Harmony, it's so much better than unison. It's so much richer than unison. Thank you. (laughs) 
God's dream is creation in harmony. Not unison, not lockstep. Harmony, where every human who bears God's image, meaning all of us, get to make their own marks and play their own notes and it comes together and the world that was very good becomes even better because of what humanity has done to make it work in a way that matches who God is. And this is not just like a one and done thing in creation. The notes ring through the whole story of scripture. So I want to give you a couple examples. You'll see it in, for example, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is my favorite book of the Bible, so you're going to have to bear with me on some Deuteronomy if y'all haven't read it. It's amazing. It really, it really is, I promise. Okay, Deuteronomy 10, verses 17 to 21. Okay, it's going to start with the unique character of Yahweh God. We're going to see how God is just and how God has a unique and particular concern for the vulnerable. For Yahweh, your God, is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And then here is how Israel can be in harmony with and reflecting God's own character. You are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. There's God's character, and there's all of Israel working in ways that are harmonious. Or another example, Mark 4, uh, verses 30 to 32, Jesus tells this little parable about the reign of God, the kingdom, it gets called in the Gospels. It's the place that works as if Yahweh God really is ruling, and therefore the people who are part of it act in ways that would match the character of their ruler. And so Jesus said, how can I describe the kingdom of God? What story should I use to illustrate it? It's like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It's the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of all garden plants. It grows long branches, and birds can make nests in its shade. The image of God's goodness and justice and joy ever expanding. It creates flourishing throughout the world. Nesting birds find a home in its shade, and So you just see even one piece of how this would work, that in our own small, beautiful, ordinary, we're creating home. We create home and it reflects the character of our God. It's a place where we don't have to perform or earn anything. And that is true whether home is shared or yourself, whoever is in it, as you host guests there, you're creating it here. At restore together. Home for one another is harmony and reflecting God's own character. One more example. You hear the notes ring out in a letter like Ephesians. This is chapter 4, verse 31. And the Ephesian church is figuring out how to do life together when they came from a lot of different backgrounds and a lot of different stories. And so this is just one example where Paul wants to encourage them on what it will look like for them to live the dream, how they can be reflecting. And then it's going to end, you'll see, with God's own character as the animating force of it all. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. In our family, we have um, some delightfully strong-willed, opinionated, non-compliant children. (laughs) I think they get it from my husband. (laughs) And my younger has been having a really hard time with what happens when that comes out. There is right now a lot of yelling and door slamming and stomping, and it's hard. One thing we talk about is how God is an always forgiver. It's part of our mending template as a family when we need to come back to each other. Side note, 
It is amazing how when you stop trying to use God in the Bible to make your kids compliant and instead try to introduce kids to the God of the Bible and what they're really like, everything flips. Like the difference between shaming them for having harsh words rage and all the rest that comes with it and instead pointing them to the God who's the always forgiver after it's done. This is what we're doing as we come into harmony. Now, I'm going to stop with those three examples, but the reality is I could go on and on because the note rings through the story of Scripture. Who God is rings out, and always humanity is invited to join in if they'd like. It's unchanging God's dream, but God doesn't ever do it on their own because that would not be in alignment with and harmonious to God's own character. God's character is to share power. That is what Genesis 1 is helping establish. It is God's character to partner with and expand creatively and empower others to join in. If God were doing it all on their own, that would actually be out of alignment with their own character. And something important would be missing from the dream come true. And so our kids. Our kids can grow up in a faith that's captivated by the dream and helps them discover how they uniquely reflect God's character. They can grow up in a family that helps them hear God's song and learn to play in harmony. They can grow up in a group like you all, who together live in harmony with and reflect God's own character as a group, as you live and love one another, and to Austin, as you go about your workplaces and your friendships and life, you're all living in service of the dream and kids can be part of that. And I fear that we don't spend enough time dwelling on the dream. How is the dream made real becomes one of our next questions. The myth is that we obey our way there. We work really hard to be really good. We teach our kids to do the same. But it jumps over some pretty key realities, like how God always goes first to help us see it, to help us trust it, to help us join in. Over and over, God goes first. God goes first in creating this good world and putting humans in it. God goes first in freeing Israel from slavery and then giving them the promised land. God goes first in showing up in Jesus to invite us into the family. God goes first in sending the spirit to animate the church that would live and love in ways that match who God is. God always keeps going first so that people can then live the story and tell it that this was who God is, and this is what God's done. Because when we hear the story, that's what starts to spark hope in us. Maybe this God can be trusted with me, with my hopes and my fears, with my people, my passions, my dreams, my desires. Maybe this God can even be trusted with my ugly parts and my addictions. Maybe all of this that's in me can come to this God and they will only respond by leading me to life. And that's, I think, what obedience really is, by the way, practicing walking a path that leads to life because we think that that's what God's offering, because life is the dream. We don't spend enough time dwelling on the dream. Even now, depending on what church context you all have come from in the past, I know some of you are waiting for me to say, but... You're waiting, you know there's a but. You've heard the story with the but. But sin. Okay, fine, but sin. What about sin? See, the thing about sin is you have to define it well. How you define it matters a lot. Meaning, we gotta listen to the whole story, to the way that various writers describe what it is and how it works and what God has done to overcome it. But that is actually only possible when we really understand the dream because sin is its opposite. It is God's opposite. It's the force that's gonna work against the harmony that would flow through the world and the goodness that would permeate everything and this whole creation being aligned with who God is 
it's going to work against the dream. So if we don't actually dwell on the dream, we're not going to have a good understanding of what sin actually is. And what's incredibly important about all of that, most of all, is what God does about it. A good working definition of sin does matter for us and for our kids alike because it helps interpret why the world is so far from the dream. It names what stands in the way of God's dream. It describes what God has overcome and will overcome to make the dream reality. But here's the thing with kids, if we're not careful, they don't ever get to hear the story of the dream. They're only ever given the butt. Because we think we're supposed to tell them that they're sinners. And I have to whisper it because I think there are probably a few young image bearers among us this morning, and I don't want them getting mistaken that that's their name tag. It's not. They are image bearers. But if you spend enough time in certain faith circles, you'll catch that there's a version that says you need to make sure that kids know they're sinners because how else will they know that they need God? And if they don't know that they need God, then you've got to be really scared about what's going to happen when they don't recognize that need and respond to that need. And so you have to start there. But what kids need to know most of all about sin is where they find God and themselves in the face of it namely side by side, shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, because God would never stand to stay apart. When I've uh, been in kids' ministry spaces, which is a lot of my past career, we have to tell kids this story. We get to tell them all about what's going on. And over and over again, these lessons get written where we tell kids all about Genesis 1 and the good world God made and all the fuzzy creatures that crawl along the ground. But, and we end on Genesis 3. Bye, have a nice rest of your Sunday, everybody. They are two separate stories. The dream goes first and it stands alone because it is the stronger force than Genesis 3 and anything else that happens. We need to dwell on the dream so that we know that every child is an image bearer, full stop. Not a potential image bearer or a future image bearer or a junior image bearer, a full image bearer stamped by God. We are raising kids to see themselves as image bearers and that is Christian parenting not devotions that are done just right necessarily, not perfectly done prayers at bedtime. My kids can't go to bed for anything anyway. (laughs) We're raising them to know they're image bearers. We're raising them to know that so is everybody else. And that is Christian parenting. It's as simple as phrases like, you are a gift and a joy and just who God made you to be. Or, Every person was made by God with so much care. So we're going to practice being careful with people. To put this another way, you are not trying to save your sinner child from being separated from a God who maybe doesn't really like him that much. You are introducing your good kid to the God who made them so because that God is enamored with them and can't wait for them to be part of the dream. And there's a world of difference between the two. I don't know if you know this, but the first question of the Westminster Catechism, yeah, that's where we're going right now, just for a sec. I know. Deuteronomy, Westminster Catechism, Zach is back next week. (laughs) The question is, what is the purpose of humanity? This little guide that you give young people about who they are and what they're supposed to be. The answer? to glorify God and enjoy God forever. Enjoy. Not honor, not fear, not even obey. Enjoy. The glory and the joy, they're like two sides of the same coin. 
which means we get to focus most of all on helping young people get to know a God who is, in fact, enjoyable. Example, hedgehogs. We are nurturing joy-filled families, and that is Christian parenting. So then you ask, what gives our family joy? Are you game people or gaming people? Do you watch silly videos on YouTube? It's a little bit like Mary Poppins. You find the fun and snap, only instead of the job becomes a game, you find the fun and you snap, and your family is more oriented towards the dream through joy because our purpose is to enjoy God forever. Because God's dream is a world in harmony with and reflecting of God's own character, Christian parenting is anything a parent who loves and trusts Jesus does to help their child see the world that way. Anything. Anything that helps them hear the note that God sings out and find their way to fall into harmony with it as the child they are, that's Christian parenting. It's anything we do to help them understand why the world looks so far from the dream and what is God going to do about it through the people who love and trust God and keep moving to make it real. I know a lot of us want to nurture a faith our kid doesn't have to heal from. If that's you, allow yourself to get swept away by the dream. Let it captivate you. Get all caught up in it, even if it seems far-fetched and wild. Your vision for being a family of faith, it's going to start there. And then you get to allow the rest of your parenting to be beautifully ordinary and imperfect. Find things that help your kid grow into who they're made to be, that nurture health, that are wise, apologize a lot, forgive. Just do the little things from there. Practice being a family that imperfectly lives the dream come true making your mark, finding your notes, harmonizing. Let's pray. God, this dream, it's a lot to take in. When we consider what the world is really like, as much as we want to see it realized, it can feel almost silly. And yet, and yet it's where you're moving. It is where things will be in the end. And so God, I especially pray for those of us parenting and raising young people. Help us become captivated by the dream again. Help us not to fear that it's foolish to trust it. Just like it's not foolish to trust you. God, for the parents, I bless them in your name with courage to strike their own notes, to be in harmony in a way that is just who their family is, whether it looks like anybody else or not, in service of the dream and for your glory. And I pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.